Um, we're going to jump right into skills now, and we're going to start with pulse. Um, so the first thing that we need in order to do any skill ever is our care plan. So what I'm going to do now is bring up the skills page from the skills book so that we can view the care plan. So measure and record pulse is the name of this skill. The care plan says the patient will be lying in bed for the skill. Take their patient's radial pulse measured at the wrist for one full minute and record your readings. Now that means that we have to count for one full minute. If you guys have family members, if you have loved ones that work in medicine and those people have told you, oh, we always count for 15 seconds and multiply it by four, they're right. In most cases, that's certainly absolutely appropriate because we don't have time to, you know, to count for one full minute all the time. And truthfully, there's no need to unless there's a problem. So generally speaking, counting for 15 seconds and multiplying that number by four will get you your count for a pulse rate over a minute. And pulses are always measured over a minute. So if you count for 15 seconds, multiply that by four, that gives you your pulse rate over a minute. But this patient, this one right here, the one we're doing the test on is not normal. This patient needs us to count the pulse for one full minute. So maybe the nurse has to give a medication that slows down the heart rate. And we gotta make sure that the heart rate is fast enough before we give the medication so we don't slow it down too much. Or maybe this patient had a breathing treatment that elevates the heart rate. And the nurse wants to spot check to see just how high the heart rate actually went. Or, Maybe the patient's not feeling so great right now and is having a little bit of dizziness. It doesn't matter why the nurse wants this pulse counted for one full minute. That doesn't matter. What matters is the nurse wants the pulse for one full minute and that's what we have to do. We don't question why we have to count for one full minute. We just do what the care plan says. So moving on, I wanna, um, point out that it says the patient's radial pulse measured at the wrist. So this actually tells you where the radial pulse is. So we're going to count the patient's radial pulse measured at the wrist. So we're going to count for one full minute. Now if we scroll down a little bit more, we can look at the bottom to find out some testing information on this. So our test info says that this skill should take somebody with your level of experience about five minutes. This is gonna be done on a live person. That means you might actually be the patient for this skill. The patient will be lying in bed. Documentation is required. A normal value, a normal heart rate over a minute is 60 to 100. And for the test, you can be off by four beats per minute in either direction and still be considered accurate. Now up here, I wanna point this out to you, right here is the documentation sheet. And this is what it would look like for the state exam. So you're gonna have a documentation sheet. And if you notice, there's actually two places here for documentation. So I'm gonna stop sharing the screen real quick and come back to me. So in Florida, if you remember, I said that there are two RN evaluators for the state of Florida. All other states have one. Florida special, we get two evaluators. But each one of those evaluators has to be able to grade you independently. So that means that you're gonna have to count with evaluator number one and let them judge your accuracy. And then you're gonna have to count with evaluator number two and let them judge your accuracy. Now, they don't expect you to do the opening and the closing twice for this skill. It's not like you have to do the whole skill twice. You just have to do the counting part twice. So you're gonna do your opening, wash your hands, count the radial pulse with evaluator number one, and they're gonna let you write that down just so you don't have to remember it. And then the evaluators are gonna tell you that they're gonna change positions. So the evaluator will say, we're going to, uh, I'm gonna change out with the other evaluator, I need you to count with that person too. So then you would count with evaluator number two, and then you'll do your closing, wash your hands, and then document the second reading. They're just gonna let you write down the first one because in a clinical setting, you're not actually counting with anybody else. 
else, much less two other people. So that it's not really a true test of real life scenario. So you're going to count with evaluator number one. They're going to let you write that down just so you don't forget it. Then you'll count with evaluator number two, and that's where it picks back up like real life. Then you would wash your hands and document that. So does that make sense to everybody? Does that make sense? You have to count twice for this skill. Everybody good with that? Count twice in Florida. And I know not all of you are from Florida. I know some of you are from other states. Um, but Florida is kind of unique with that. You have to count twice. So here you can see the mannequin. Now remember, for the test, this is a live person in this bed, not a mannequin. So for the test, it's a real body here. I don't have any real bodies in this room to use right now. So we're going to use the mannequin just so you can see. But when you're taking a pulse, it is okay to raise the forearms so you don't have to bend. Because me bending over like this, remember I have to count for one full minute. This is a long time to be in a bent position to get, you know, I'm not gonna be comfortable. This is gonna hurt my back over some time. But you don't wanna lift a patient's whole arm up like this because this isn't comfortable for the patient. A minute is a very long time. So you're gonna kind of um, split the difference. We're gonna keep the elbow on the bed so it's supported and just lift the forearm up, find the pulse, and now I can stand up straight and be comfortable. The patient is still comfortable because the elbow is supported on the bed, but it allows me to take the pulse without inconveniencing them or me. Now for some of you, some of you are tall, and even elevating the forearm isn't enough. You're still gonna to have to bend. So in that case, elevating the entire bed up to a comfortable working height might be more beneficial. So I'm gonna turn you around just a little bit here and I'm gonna show you hospital beds are unique because they're able to be adjusted. Okay, so you guys can see the bed there. Bed controller is right here. So if I press the head of the bed and the up arrow, the whole head of the bed moves. I can press head of the bed and down arrow and the bottom of the bed moves. Now down here, at the very bottom here is a crank. This is a manual bed. So that means that I have to manually crank this to raise the whole bed up, but I can do that. If you notice, as I crank it, the whole bed moves. Everybody good with that? So you can move the whole bed up so it's a little bit more comfortable to you. But the most important part is to lower the bed at the end of the scale to make sure that it's always in the starting position. Now let me explain why. Okay, so that's where it started. But let me explain why. This patient has been sleeping in a bed. Let me move this back. This patient has been sleeping in a bed probably for her entire life, right? Since she was about a year and a half or two years old and climbed out of her crib and mom put her in a toddler bed. So she's been sleeping in a bed for a very long time. Now, she goes to bed, swings her legs in, is out like a light, sleeps for eight or 10 hours, or six or eight hours, depending on your sleep schedule. And she wakes up in the morning and she's groggy, not fully awake, and she swings her legs out. And you know what? That floor is always right where she left it. For however many years she's been alive, that floor has always been right where she left it. And when she's groggy and sleepy and not awake yet, she doesn't think about the floor not being there. It's because it's always been there. But if you raise this bed up to a comfortable working height, what you did was move the floor. So when this patient who always has had that floor in the same position always, when you move this bed up and that patient tries to get out of bed and that floor is not where they left it, they will fall getting out of bed. Because this is a habit. The floor is always in the same place when you get up in the morning than it was when you went to bed that night. Hospital beds are different because we can raise them. Now, hospital beds that are automated, more like this one, 
This is more of a true hospital style bed. These bed controls are generally on the side rails. So if you look, there's buttons here. And this one right here, it shows the whole bed, has an up arrow. So if I press that, the whole bed moves up to a comfortable working height. This one moves a lot easier than the crank one. But if I put the bed up, I have to remember to lower it again at the end of the skill. And if I don't, it's an automatic fail. Automatic fail. Let me say that again. If you bring the whole bed up to a comfortable working height and then don't lower it at the end, it is an automatic fail. I don't care what a great job you did on the skill, doesn't matter. Because when that patient gets up out of bed and that floor is not where they expect it to be, they won't readjust, they will fall. If we go back to this care plan, and remember that care plan is on page 38 of your skills book. So if you go to that care plan and you see that it says to measure the radial pulse at the wrist for one full minute. So let's find that pulse. Now remember, we have to follow that care plan. And you may know of other pulses. We have a brachial pulse here in the elbow region. You've got an axillary one underneath your arm. You've got carotid pulses in the neck. You've got femoral pulses in the groin. You've got popliteal pulses at the back of the knee. And you've got dorsal pedalis pulses at the top of the foot. So we have lots of pulse points in the body, but this care plan says radial pulse measured at the wrist. So if you try to get fancy for the state exam and take the pulse somewhere else to show the evaluators, hey, I know how to take a pulse somewhere else, you're gonna fail because the care plan specifically says radial pulse measured at the wrist. They're not interested in you showing off and, and you know demonstrating something crazy and wild and, you know, to, to show that you know things. They're interested in you following that care plan. So don't get fancy follow the care plan. So we're gonna find the radial pulse measured at the wrist. Now, <clears throat> if you look at my wrist here, I'm gonna bring my arm around. So if you look at my wrist here, <clears throat> there is a bone that runs right here, right at the top of my wrist. If you find that bone, see where at the bendy part of the, the uh, wrist, not down here. I don't wanna be down here. I wanna be way up here at the part where my wrist bends, so where the lines are. If you find that bone right there where your wrist bends and you put two fingers up on that bone, like standing, like you're gonna dive off a cliff, okay? So you stand those fingers up at the top of your wrist at the bone and then you roll your hand forward and put your thumb on the back, just like this, your fingers should be right on that pulse point. So you should be able to feel thumps under your finger so stand up on the bone, roll forward, put your thumb on the back. Now, the reason that you have to put your thumb on the back, okay, so stand up, roll forward, and put your thumb on the back. The reason for that, if you just put your fingers there, you might feel the thumps. You might. I mean, it, they're, they're right there. But the problem is that we have to count for one full minute. Man, that's a long time. You're about to find out just how long a minute is. And what happens, if you just set your fingers there, your fingers will relax over that full minute. So you've got your fingers here and you're counting 38, 39, 40, 41. Where'd it go? You will lose it because your fingers relaxed. If you put your fingers here and your thumb on the back side, see how that holds a C, a C shape? That holds consistent pressure against that pulse, and that way you don't lose it. So that thumb on the back of your wrist is what's gonna keep that pulse um, able to be measured over that full minute. So with the pulse, and that's, a, that's kind of a common thing, is sometimes you can find the pulse like that, no problem, and you can feel it all the way through the minute count. Other times you find the pulse, but it's really faint, it's hard to feel. 
or you might find it and then it goes away as you're counting. So those are all very, very common problems. Um, the first thing that I'm going to address is everyone's artery, and that's what we're feeling. We're feeling a wave of blood moving through an artery. We're actually pressing down on the artery, kind of like a straw. Okay, if you have a straw and you're drinking through the straw, you can't really, if you've got your fingers on it, you can't really feel the liquid moving through the straw because the straw is wide open. But if you pinch that straw, now you can feel stuff moving through the straw. Well, this is the same type of um, situation. So when you have uh, a pulse, you're pushing the artery up against the bone. So if you look at the wrist, right? Remember, we have a bone right here. When we put our fingers there, we actually push that artery up against the bone. So we're squeezing the straw so we can feel those waves as they move through. Well, everybody's artery is buried a little bit differently. So some people's arteries are super close to the surface. So you barely have to put any pressure at all. Put your thumb on the back and you'll be able to feel the thumps. No problem. Other arteries are buried way deeper. So the best thing to do is to start light and then push a little harder. If you can't feel it, push a little harder. Just gradually increase your pressure until you get a good, strong, solid thump under your finger. So start light and then gradually push in a little bit more, a little bit more until you get that good, strong pulse. You also have to make sure that your fingers don't relax during this. And that's the number one um, problem that most CNAs encounter because you're not used to holding pressure like this for a full minute. And your fingers, well, they'll just naturally try to relax on you. So you have to pay really close attention to keep those fingers in that position so that you can feel the thumps, okay? So okay. You, you find the spot, Gradually increase your pressure until you can feel the good strong thumps. But during the test, if you, um, if you lose it, you can restart. Just tell the patient, I'm sorry, I have to recount that. Look at the clock, pick another starting point and say start out loud and then count for your full minute. Trust me, the, the evaluators will keep up. They're smart cookies. They'll be able to know exactly what you're doing. But let's say that you're here and you start light and you push down nothing, push down nothing, push down nothing. So then you might want to go up a little bit more or down just a little bit more. It's in this area right here. I don't know if you can see, but it's in this area right here. But it could be a little bit closer to the top. It could be a little bit further down. But it's somewhere in this area right here. So if you don't find it initially, you know, when you, when you uh, put your fingers down and you increase the pressure, just move your fingers ever so slightly to a, just a little bit different area. And you may be able to pick it up a little bit better then. Okay, so I'm going to run over and grab my clock real quick. And we are going to count the pulse for one full minute. So in just a second, I'm going to have you find your pulse. And when I say start, I want you to count the thumps you feel under your finger until I say stop. Because I'm going to, I'll do the timing for one full minute. Okay, so let me just go grab my clock. Okay, so when I say start... I want you to start counting the thumps that are under your finger until I say stop. And this way you can practice counting for one full minute. I'll do the timing for you. All right, so I'm gonna give everybody about 10 seconds to find your, your pulse. So find the pulse in your wrist. When I say start, start counting your thumps. Ready? Start.
stop. Okay. Did everyone get a number? How many times your heart beat? How many thumps you felt under your fingers? So tell me your numbers. Awesome. Okay, so most of you got somewhere between uh, 60 and 100. Some of you got 57, 59, which is perfectly okay. You're not going to die. You're fine. Um, but normal is between 60 and 100. And most of you are in that range, somewhere between 60 and 100. What do you think we should do if we get a number less than 60? So for those of you who got 57 or 59 is the heart rate, what do you think we should do with that information? Very good. So we're going to report that to the nurse. Very good. So if you get anything under 60, you need to report it to the nurse. If you get anything over 100, you need to report it to the nurse. Anything between 60 and 100, we would document unless the nurse told us differently. Um, and sometimes that happens. Sometimes we know as nurses that our patient's pulse rates are, you know, kind of low. If we've got a patient on a certain medication, it keeps the heart rate low. So I may have in the care plan to count the patient's pulse for one full minute, report any reading under 50. So that means if you got 57, that would just be documented. Even though it's abnormal, the nurse is expecting abnormal. They're giving you different parameters to work with for reporting. Sometimes we know the patient's heart rate is high normally. You know, they run at one, you know, 106, 108. That's just their normal. So that care plan may say report any abnormals in excess of 110. So your nurse will always indicate on the care plan if there's anything different that we should be reporting. But normally, between 60 and 100 is normal. Anything outside of that would need to be reported. For the exam, you will get on the written test at least one question on vital signs. They will give you a whole list of vital signs and ask you which one of these is abnormal or which one needs to be reported to the nurse. Or they may even say your um, patient has a temperature of 101.1, a pulse rate of 100, a respiration rate of 18, and a blood pressure of 116 over 72. Which one of those needs to be reported? So you would have to know what normal vital signs are to know which one of those was abnormal. And by the way, it was temperature. Um, so you would need to, to know those normal vital signs. In your skills book, if you go back just a couple of pages to 32, these are abnormal vital signs. So here it shows you all of the normal vital signs, the ranges for all of the normal vital signs. It tells you about documenting. And then this page is a vital sign activity. So this page actually lets you practice knowing which vital signs need to be reported and which ones don't. So that's a good activity for you to work on so that you can kind of um, get ready for that question on the test. So any questions on that? Let me. Um, yes, um, and for the skill when they put um, to measure the pulse, sometimes it takes time to take, to find the pulse of a patient. Do they, um, do they let, do they give you the option like to wait till, till you find it or is it something that the time is measured? Okay, very good question. That's exactly where I was going next. So great segue. Okay, so for this um, practice period, what I just had you count your pulse, right? I did the timing for you. So that just kind of took that out because I wanted you to find the pulse and get practiced at counting. And if you were too busy looking at the clock, you, you would lose track of what you were trying to count. So I took that out of the equation. I did that part for you. But for the test, you are actually in charge of timing as well. So for the test, you're gonna find the pulse. You're gonna look at the clock, right? You find the pulse, you look at the clock. You pick a starting point and you say start out loud. And then the evaluator will start counting when you do. So saying start out loud has the evaluator start and stop counting when you do. So for the test, you are in charge of timing 
as well as counting. So this is really important that you not look at the clock because your brain is hardwired. You can't stop this, this is psychology. Your brain will always pay attention to what it sees first, then what it hears, then what it feels. That's just the way that our stimuli is processed. So if you're staring at this clock, right? If you're staring at this clock and you're feeling thumps under your finger, you're probably going to be counting the seconds as you see them because seeing is always interpreted before feeling. So if you're staring at this clock, especially the clocks that tick, you know which ones I'm talking about where the second hand actually jumps? This is a sweeping hand, it makes it a little bit easier. But if that second hand jumps, man, it's all over. Your, your brain can't pay attention to what it feels, not without a whole lot of practice. So when you're taking, when you're taking the test, you wanna look at the clock, pick a starting point, okay? So we have our clock, we're picking a starting point, and we say start, and then we look away. Don't look at that clock, don't stare at it, don't. Remember how long a minute was? It was a very, 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 very long time. So we don't need that clock. In fact, I don't even have it up there on the screen. We don't need it. It's, we're, we're not even at 20 seconds yet. Just keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. And then eventually you get to a point where you're like, oh, let me just check and see where we're at. So let's take a look. All right, well, we're almost halfway there. Okay, we're halfway now. Let's put this down, let's look away. We're not gonna look, not gonna look, not gonna look, not gonna look. We're still counting what we feel, counting what we feel. And then we'll glance again. Where are we at? Okay, we got about 15 seconds left. So we're gonna look away, not gonna look, not gonna look. I'm still counting the thumps under my finger. I'm concentrating on the thumps. Well, now I know I'm getting close. So I'm gonna look again. Up, oh, almost there. And we're gonna look back and stop, okay? So when you're counting, you don't stare at the clock. You look at it, you say start, and then you look away. And you wait a long time before you look back. And trust me, that minute is way longer than you think it is. So you wait a long time, then you glance back and see where you're at. And then as the minute gets closer to being done, you glance back more frequently. But if you stare at that clock, you're not going to count the thumps, you're gonna end up counting the seconds instead. So remember there's 60 seconds in a minute and there's 60, which is a normal pulse rate. So if you're counting a pulse and you're looking at the clock and you get 60, you may think, oh, that's, that's a normal pulse rate, it's fine. Not realizing that no, 60 is, that means you probably counted the seconds, not the thumps that you felt under your finger. So if you get the number 60, it's always a good idea to recount just to make sure that you truly were counting the thumps and not the, you know, the seconds that are on the clock. Now this is even worse if you've got a loud clock. Have you ever heard those clocks that just tick really loud, tick, tick, tick? If you've got a loudly ticking clock, it's really hard to count the pulse because your brain, remember what you see, then what you hear, then what you feel. So if you've got a loudly clip, uh, clicking, ticking clock, boy, say that twice fast, ticking clock, then you will actually start to count the ticks rather than the thumps. So be careful. If you get the number 60, it's always a good idea just to double check re count um, and really pay close attention to those thumps because the clock may have thrown you off. So I'm going to unmute you. Any questions on that? All right. So Rita has a question. She says, what can be the cause of the pulse to be abnormal and what are the health implications? This would take months, literally. Um, and this is part of what you would have to go to nursing school for. There are Every single condition can have an impact on cardiac health. So it's um, very rare that, uh, remember I said before how, you know, this book goes into all of, of the health systems, all of the different body systems, and how, you know, one system can impact another. Well, 
uh, elevated heart. So let's just go high. So let's say we have somebody who has a pulse rate over a hundred. Well, that could be due to anxiety. It could be due to dehydration. It can be due to fever. It can be due to um, heart disease. It can be due to a medication. It could be due to um, uh, a diabetic um, event where you know you've got a, a higher level of blood sugar. Uh, it, it could be due to a bazillion different reasons. Same thing on the low end. Um, if you've got a super low heart rate, it could be because the heart isn't pumping very well. It could be because of a calcium imbalance. It could be, I mean, th there's just so many different options and there's no way for me to know. I mean, I've got to look at, as a nurse, I have to look at the head to toe assessment, I have to look at the lab values, I have to look at, at the patient's disposition. Um, th there's so many things that I have to evaluate to figure out what's causing the abnormal heart rate. Um, what are the health implications? Well, if your heart isn't beating fast enough, then we have to look at how strong it's beating, right? Because rate and strength are two totally different things. So if you've got a heart that's beating very slow, but it's beating very strongly, then that's enough to push blood around to all of the vital organs in the body, and that's good. In fact, people that are cardiac athletes, so these are your runners, your cyclists, your swimmers. I'm not talking about people that go to Planet Fitness a couple times a week. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the Michael Phelps and Lance Armstrongs of the world, okay? People that devote their life to cardio fitness. They generally have a very low resting heart rate. You might only have a heart rate of 40, and that's because the heart is a muscle, just like any other muscle in the body. If I went to the gym and I did bicep curls all day long, I'd have biceps to kill for. Clearly, I don't, but I would have biceps to kill for. But the problem is, um, you know, I mean, just because I'm strengthening my biceps doesn't mean that I'm working on anything else. That's just one muscle group. Well, with cardiac athletes, people that run all the time or bicycle or swim, and they put a lot of time and effort into it, they actually strengthen their heart muscle. So each contraction pushes out a ton of blood because the muscle itself is so strong. So their heart squeezes and it pushes out this whoosh of blood, whole lot of blood. So it doesn't have to beat as often because, you know, 40 of those beats does the same work as 80 of my beats, right? So having a low heart rate itself is not a bad thing if the heart muscle is strong. Now, if you've got a low heart rate and the heart muscle is weak, now that's a real emergency because then the heart isn't pushing blood to the kidneys or the brain or the liver, and we're going to have long-term effects of that, okay? Now, what if the heart is too fast? Well, you know, the heart is like any other muscle in your body. If you weren't used to running uphill, right? And you, you had to run fast uphill, your legs are eventually going to get tired and you're just not going to be able to go as fast or go as far. And eventually you're just going to be undone, right? So same thing with the heart. If you're asking the heart, if the heart is beating 120 times a minute, it's not used to beating that fast and it's like going uphill and eventually it's just going to like, <sighs> I'm done. So what are the implications? Well, pretty serious implications um, for a heart rate that's too slow or a heart rate that's too fast. It's not really the implications. It, as a nurse, I've got to figure out what's causing that and what can I do to help remedy that situation. Does that make sense? Okay, we'll give her just a minute to respond. Okay, very good, yes. So as a CNA, we really don't need to know what the cause of a high or low heart rate is. Um, that's not really our, our thing. Um, we don't really even need to know what that's gonna cause in the patient, what kind of long-term implications or even short-term implications that might have. Our responsibility is to notice that, hey, this heart rate is low, it's under 60. I probably ought to let the nurse know about that. And that way the nurse can do that, that higher level investigation to figure out, is this a problem or is this not? There are some people that walk around with a heart rate in the low hundreds that are fine. 106, 108, that is just their normal 
everyday heart rate, you know, and, and they've had tests and everything is fine. There's no problem. And then there's people that hit 108 and their heart can just like be done, you know? So it's all about the patient. It's never about the number. The number just clues us in. The number's a clue, but it's all about the patient. So we look at every patient individually. You might go to a nurse and say, hey, bed A has a heart rate of 40. And she goes, oh yeah, that's fine. And bed B has a heart rate of 40. And she goes, oh my gosh, and she runs. <laughs> so they both have the same heart rate. Why did she run with one and not the other? Because it's the patient that's under that heart rate. Okay, good. 